Hello everyone, this is Al-Fadi and I want to welcome you back to another video of our new series on the search for Muhammad. Uh, we've been talking about some of the problems that uh, are basically uh, being uncovered, uh, which contradict uh, the traditional uh, historical information that we have about Muhammad, for instance, or Mecca, uh, or even uh, other things related to the origin of Islam. Today we're going to uh, continue along this line and we're going to take a look at two important uh, basically um, uh, parts of the history of Muhammad. One, for instance, uh, has to do with the so-called the Hijra, where the Islamic calendar basically started it when supposedly Muhammad and Abu Bakr left Mecca uh, because they were being persecuted and there was a threat to assassinate him and left at night, left his cousin Ali in bed and went and went to a cave and you know, and a spider basically covered that cave and protected them and that's why we have a chapter on a spider. But nevertheless, Muhammad ended up basically going to Medina and that started it what we call the Islamic calendar. In fact, if you wanna uh, look at the Islamic date, the Islamic date is totally different. It's uh, 1400 plus, why, because that basically commemorate the date when Muhammad migrated from Mecca to Medina. And then we're going to look about another thing that has to do with the name Mecca itself. So I'm going to let, of course, uh, no other than Dr. J. Smith to unpack these two problems for us. Dr. J., thank you again for being here with us. Well, it's good to be here. Thank so you so much. So what's going on with the Hijra and also Mecca? Okay, well here we got, and this is fascinating because when we talk about the Hijrah, we're talking about the Abbasid view of the Hijrah versus what really did happen in 622. The, by the time the Abbasids finally write this down, uh, they have a whole different narrative than what actually did happen in 622. Now you know what happened in 622. In 622 is when Heraclius, the Byzantine emperor, comes and destroys the Sassanians who had been the oppressors of the Arabs, both mostly all Christians, and of course some of them are Persian, but they are mostly the Lachmids and the Ghassanids. These are the people that were under the oppression of the Sassanids, and that's why when Heraclius destroys them, he destroys his oppression. That became a huge year, and that's when we're going to, haven't got to him yet, but Ilyas ibn Kabisa comes into the picture, because he is the one that actually changes, to, uh, uh, changes his allegiance and actually supports then the Arabs. And that's when you see what's happening in the 7th century, but that's not the story we get by the 9th and 10th century, two to three hundred years later. This story has this Muhammad that they have now created as their prophet to be to take give that identity in the prophet prophetic line. This is when he's moved from a city called Mecca to Medina, and of course they point to that event. Uh, they point to that event in chapter two, uh, looking at this same idea. But let's go back and let's go to the slide and let's start bringing this up. So let's open the slide, and there you have the first reference. Now it's fascinating. You don't have any reference to the Hijra, which means Movement, it means like an exodus, doesn't right, it? Right, that's the word where you, itself. That's where you get the word muhajirin or muhajirun. People of know. the hijra. Exactly. Un means plural, who masculine. Migrated. Yeah. They migrate, the people yeah. who are uh, migrant, which is fascinating because the muhajirun is a reference to the seventh century. The Arabs would call them some muhajirun and these would be nomadic people, the people who are always moving from place to place to place, the muhajirun, right. the right. people who are moving. That word that is now implied in, and it's first written down by Ibn Ishaq, hold on a minute. Did I we just talk about Ibn Ishaq earlier? Yep. How do we know that Ibn Ishaq wrote this down? Well, I mean, uh, we, we found don't. out that Ibn Ishaq wrote it later. We have <laughs> nothing about Ibn Ishaq. So actually, it's Ibn Hisham that actually writes this down. It is Ibn Hisham <coughs> who then introduces this in the 833. That's the ninth century. Let's go back to the slide again. So Ibn Hisham has to rewrite what they, he says was written by Ibn Ishaq. Obviously, this is now the narrative that the Abbasids want you to believe. During the Abbasid area. Remember I said over and over again in these episodes, we're going to come to the Abbasid area because the Abbasids really have a narrative that is different than that which precedes. And this happens, listen, this is nothing new. This happens all the time. You have you know, two different groups of people that are at war with each other, they hate each other, finally one has ascendancy over the other, and that person then, the, the ones who have ascendancy then create their, they usually create their own capital. Well, isn't it interesting, the Abbasids do no longer, they don't want to live in Damascus, they're from the Persian background, they want to live in what used to be Stesiphon, then becomes Baghdad. 
and they introduced Baghdad as their capital. Now, this is, this is given its name in the ninth century. Nonetheless, they now bring their capital down to Iraq, not serious now Iraq. But they absolutely hate everything that has happened because for a hundred years they've been under they've been on the oppression of these these Umayyads living up there in Damascus. So what do they do? Well, they eradicate, they destroy all the stories that aggrandize the Umayyads, and they introduce their own story. That's why Ibn Ishaq then starts to introduce their own prophet, and he's the one that first writes that down, but we don't have Ibn Ishaq, we only have Ibn Isham. Ibn Isham finally writes the credentialized story, the narrative right. that has become the official narrative. Later on, another 40 years, then you get the traditions concerning the sayings of the prophet. 600,000 of these sayings are whittled down to 7,397. 98% are thrown out, only two are returned by al Bughari. What happened to those 98%? I would love to be able to read them because I think an awful lot of those 98% include all these original stories from the Umayyad period, which is really probably what say an awful lot about Il, uh, Ilyas ibn Kabisa. Uh, we're gonna get to that when we get to ibn Kabisa because al Bughari does mention him though it's a deformation of Islam. Let's get back now to the Hijra. Let's go back to the slide again. They're hated by the Abbasids. They eradicate the history of the Umayyads, and they include their own history, their own re references to these battles. That's uh, the, the battles you see uh, al waqidi is introducing. Now, what's fascinating, they introduce a lot of their new stories surrounding their Prophet Muhammad, including this story of 622 because they need this to give him a, a handle for himself in the seventh century. But instead of referring to the defeat of the Persians by the Byzantines, that's not, they don't want that part in there. What do they do? They create a new narrative around Muhammad of having him move from one city to the other instead. That fits now, suddenly, this, this character moving out. Murad was really good. Murad, the guy from Middle East, he speaks and re he reads Arabic and Aramaic, and he's going back and he's saying, take a look and you will see that when you look at all these traditions that are in the Quran, if you look at these traditions, have you noticed that they all take, a, uh, they take, they take an awful lot of the, the same stories, the, the biblical prophets, and they apply it to Muhammad. So a lot right. of things that happened to him. Go ahead. A, there is an interesting one you're going to allude to right now, and I'll, I'll elaborate further when you mention it. Go ahead. Yes, about the entry, the triumphant entry of Muhammad into Medina. So who do you think that, that, that is actually modeled on? Oh, well, of course, Jesus entered Entry into Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And I tell you why, it dawned on me when I realized that they were using uh, basically Fronts. palm, you know, um, uh, you know, branches. Uh, technically speaking, that's exactly what happened when Jesus entered into Jerusalem. So if you are trying to recreate in your prophet many of the things that have come from before from the other prophets and you want him to be the seal of the prophets, you want him to be the greatest of all prophets, don't you take these stories that you have borrowed already in the Quran, they're already in the Quran, and you then take the same stories and you aggrandize it and apply it to your own prophet, exactly. including this example of him coming into Jerusalem. Exactly. Much yeah. the same thing, these palm fronds. And they were that, singing, you know, that uh, saying, Tala al badru alayna, meaning, the moon has just appeared, or the light has just appeared, and they changed the name of the city from Yathrib to Medina. Al-Medina al-Munawwara, meaning the city of light. The city of light, there you go. So you can see, this is, this. is there is a concerted effort, there is a concerted effort to bet their own narrative. So the biography follows similar stories taken in the Bible of the biblical prophets and transfer them onto Muhammad, especially those of Moses, including the ones of his persecution, followed by an exodus, there's the exodus, they want the same thing that Moses had, and then entering Medina, in this case, they're now taking that what's happened to Jesus in Jerusalem. This is symptomatic of what you do when you now become the, the leader, when you become, and you, uh, you now are the new men on the block, the new culture, you need to introduce and, and uh, aggrandize yourselves and of course your man in your book. Mm -hmm.